Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome all of you tonight. We meet weekly here at uh, Addison every week. The college consists of the following format. We'll have a brief announcements period. Our speaker will then speak. We will then have a question and answer period. And then we will have our infamous rebuttal period. That's the one everybody loves. Tonight, yeah, we have two rules. One is, one. Is, the first rule is, and most of you guys should know this, one, one fool, fool at a time. time. And the second one is, no, no personal, personal attacks. attacks. Ah. <laughs> I've yet to see them. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'm sure I'll be attacked tonight myself. But, uh, <laughs> hey, excuse me. Yeah. That should be first page. Well, I don't want them to be able to read that. Tell we'll, we'll get it down to the yeah. first page when we start. So, without, fur without further ado, I will introduce our speaker. And the topic, June 10th. It's, it's called Chicago in Black and Whites. And our speaker is Lowell Thompson. So give a big hand, a round of applause to Lowell Thompson for his presentation tonight. And Mr. Thompson, you are up anytime soon here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, you're up. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Hello. This is this is a pretty interesting looking crowd. Good. Compared to the last time I was before this August group. Wait a minute. No, this is June. It's not an August group. Uh, I don't think they, I don't think. You got you, it. You we got, got the joke. You got it. Okay. I, I used it last time, but it was in September. I think it worked better the last time. Yeah, anyway, the last time I remember that I was in front of this group, there was almost a fight before I said a word. So this time, I hope if there's going to be a fight, it happens after I talk, not before. It's Charlie. Huh? Yeah. yeah. And I actually have two. You're, you're, I think you're in luck today because I have two things to talk about. Uh, although I build this as being about my latest project, which is America in blacks and whites. But I'm doing the first aspect of it on the city that I believe is the most indicative of America's racial problems. At least the big city that is most uh, a prime exemplar of America's racial problems, which is Chicago and the city where I just happened to have been born 69 years ago. But also, as a bonus, and just in case my uh, PDF didn't work, uh, I have another project that I just uh, introduced to the, to the known world uh, about a month ago now. Uh, called Some of My Best Friends of Color. It's a coloring book. You got it. It's a coloring book. We get it. And I'm going to actually pass around some of the books, the many coloring books. And if you want, I have pages you can color, I have crayons if you want. Are you going to have bread? But that's a fallback. My main reason for being here tonight is to talk about America in blacks and whites. What's that about? What is it? I'm doing a book. I plan to do a book. Let me see if I can find my. Uh, Enjoy 
This is a book that I wrote that I think I presented to you guys uh, about a year after it came out. This is African Americans in Chicago. It's a pictorial history. It's part of the Arcadia Publishing Images of America series. When I contacted them about six years ago, they had published over 6,500 titles all over the country in their Images of America series, but they had never published one about African Americans in Chicago. I was looking for it. And I said, if you guys haven't published this book, I should be the one to write it. They said, prove it. I did, and I wrote it. The book I'm working on now, The America in Blacks and Whites, is really inspired by this book because I found that with this book, people who don't read books, like my relatives, were actually interested in this book. They actually got mad because I didn't give them one. I'm talking about people who have never, I've never seen within a hundred feet of a book in my life. Why? Why are they so interested? Because it had pictures, 200 pictures. So I said, wait a minute. I think I may have hit on something. So, America in Blacks and Whites, Chicago, has and will have over 200 pictures. Not just photographs, but charts and graphs in black and white. The subtitle of the book is A Visual Record of Racism in America. As I say on the back of the book, and Tim, you can go to the, to the next page now. As I say on the back of the book, I say, well, there's a picture first. There's a picture of, from the 1919 race riot in Chicago. It's a picture of a Uram, some people say white, man, or two Uram men throwing something at a Afam man on the ground. They're in the process of killing him. This is not a reenactment. This is an actual photograph. I found out later who took it and, and uh, not kind of the circumstances, but that's another story. Anyway, that's the visual. What I say on the back of the book, and this is just, it's rough. It's not totally uh, done yet, so uh, you might be able to give me some input on it even. It starts with, why can't black people make it in America like everyone else? I say, I've heard that phrase. I've heard it said. I've heard it implied all of my life. I've heard it implied by people who are conservative, people who tend to seem to be liberal, people who are uh, rich, people who are poor. I've heard it spoken in those exact terms or implied all of my life. I hear it now. I see it now every day. I see it in the news media. I see it in the New York Times, which runs story after story about crime in Chicago, but never does anything to analyze why that crime happens. Never connects the dots back to the beginning. That's what I'm going to do in this book. I'm going to show the pictures undeniable photographs and or graphics that were done at the time, contemporary graphics of America in blacks and whites. And my basic premise is when I show these pictures and show this, it's really evidence of why 
Black people can't make it in America like everyone else. I've got pictures of the 1919 riot. I'm going to have documents that are the black codes that were written in the 1630s and 40s when the Americrats, Americrats, that's my word, I coined that term, when the Americrats here decided that the quickest way to wealth, the only way to actually make the American colonies viable was to turn human beings, Africans, into subhuman beasts. When they started changing the laws and making the laws so that the human beings who were, at that point, the Africans, were treated a lot like the Europeans, indentured servants. But at some point, they decided, in order for us to really make the money we need to make, and to make this a viable going concern, we need to turn these human beings into subhuman beasts. And they started passing laws that said, from this day forward, anyone who is not of the Christian faith or of a certain uh, national background, like British, or Irish, or, or, or a continental background, like European, those people will now not be considered human. That's what basically, in essence, the black codes and the black laws did in the 1630s, 1640s, 20, 30 years after African Americans first arrived in the British colonies in Jamestown. I will have pictures and documents of that, of those codes, those laws written. So when somebody asks, anybody that's not asking it as a rhetorical question, why can't black folks, why can't you people make it in America like everyone else? I want to show them this. I mean, if it's not a rhetorical question. Now, mostly I see it's a rhetorical question. And I have a tendency to answer rhetorical questions. Now, the person who asks a rhetorical question usually is not looking for an answer. He's looking for an argument. He's looking for you to be intimidated. He's looking to bully you into shutting up. But I've learned that there are answers to rhetorical questions. And this book, America in Blacks and Whites, Chicago, will attempt to graphically answer the question, why can't blacks make it in America like everyone else? And it goes all the way back to the beginning. Next, Tim. Okay, I got it. Okay, the next image is actually an old image from the 1940s at Union Station. A classic shot in black and white. And I use this as just a introduction to the idea of immigration. And this, as I said, this is not, the book is not done. These are graphics to show the basic concept and the direction of the book. So that's the Union Station to introduce the idea of immigration. Next. These are babies in blacks and whites. Now, I would ask the rhetorical question, which of these two babies is likely to be killed 
before they reach the age of 21. Which of these two babies is most likely to be to go to a school that is substandard? Which of these two American babies is most likely to have a parent who doesn't have a job? Which of these two American babies is most likely to have an unwanted pregnancy before she's 15? Which of these two American babies is most likely to be born to a family where both mother and father have criminal records. Now I told you this is a rhetorical question, right? But I think you all know the answers. And my question is, why do you know the answer? Now some may say, well, you know, uh, the black baby is more likely to be born to parents who are who are uh, shiftless, who don't take care of their kids, right? That black baby is more likely to just be screwing around with every Tom, Dick, and Harry, so she's going to be pregnant before the white baby. But I asked the question. Why is that? How did that happen? Where did that come from? Are these two innocent babies inherently endowed with traits that make them more likely to do one thing or the other? Or is it the conditions that they're born in? And where did those conditions come from? In this country, the land of opportunity and equality. I think you get my drift. Next. Okay, I got the slides mixed up. Immigration in blacks and whites. Next. Anybody ever seen this picture? These are immigrants to Chicago. In 1919, where are they from? The South. Why did they leave the South? I think you can guess. These are immigrants. Ah, I think. Oh, okay. These are immigrants, American immigrants. But they had to leave the place that they were at that they were born in as refugees because of the violence and the fact that they were treated as subhuman beasts. But unlike some other immigrants, they're in the same country. They just went to another state, another city within the same country. And even though they were still not treated equally in that other city, which is Chicago, they felt that they were at least able to live. They would not be summarily lynched. Uh, hello? Uh, just try it again. Just try it again. It's working. You're good. Hello? Uh, Turn off and on. Probably take your hearing off. Hello? Hello? He says I'm shorting it. And he may be right. He's a professional. I always keep him handy just in case. So, it's working. Yeah, but we're going to change batteries. Just, to make just sure. in case. Just in case. No, that's right. 
than the ones you just saw. These are immigrants from a European country. They're not oh. Americans. This is Ellis Island. Yeah. And they've come to this country maybe a little after, maybe a little before the immigrants I just showed you. And what are their prospects in this land compared to the American immigrants? This is America in blacks and whites. Those immigrants, they may be Italian, they may be Jewish, they may be Polish, they may be, I don't know, Irish. but they're because of Irish, but they're European immigrants. And the chances are, just like the babies, that their life chances, no matter where they were when they came here, their life prospects improved exponentially compared to the non-whites, the non-white immigrants. This is America in blacks and whites. Now as far as I know, nobody has ever done this book. And I said, wait a minute. I'm just the African American guy, south side of Chicago, barely graduated from high school, got into the advertising business, did pretty well, but I'm not a scholar. There are hundreds of thousands of books written every year in this country. There are millions of books that have been written since Gutenberg did his thing. Why is it that nobody's done this book? Why is it that I've got to do it? What does that say about the reality of scholarship in this country, desire for information, for fact, for truth. What does it say that I've got to do it? But I'm going to do it. And, and guess what? I'm also going to publish it probably too. Because I don't think there's any publisher in this country that would go anywhere near this book. Why is that? We're talking about America and blacks and whites. Now usually when I say black or white as referred to a person, I put it in quotes. When I wrote my first book, 1995 was called White Folks. White Folks was in quotes. I got into the habit of doing that. Why? Because I've never met a white person. And I've never met a black one. Now everybody looks stunned as though they actually have met white people. 
and black people. I actually did this for the first time, the demonstration that led me to my coloring book. I did it in front of your group the last time I spoke. And I said, how many white people were in the room? And I had a whole bunch of people raise their hands. And I said, well, how many black people were in the room? And I had a few people raise their hands. Then I held up a white sheet of paper. And I said, I want all you white people to come up here and put your hand on this white sheet of paper. And let's see how white you are. And I said the same thing to the black, so-called black folks. Which brings me to my coloring book that I published the first mini version of a few weeks ago. And I'm going to pass a few out for you guys to kind of just look at. Would somebody help me? Chris, can you help me pass somebody around? And this relates to America and blacks and whites, too. <coughs> As I say in the coloring book, we're all colored people. Some of my best friends are colored. And we're all colored people. We're all part of the human spectrum. There are no blacks, pure black people I've seen. I'm an artist, too. I've never seen a black person. I've never seen a white one. Everybody is basically a variation on a, the color under, under your fingernail. Everybody is a darker or lighter version of that color. It's not white. Depending upon how much melanin you have in your skin, which is based on where you came from, and where your ancestors came from on Earth. That's how dark, how, how much darker or lighter, how much of a tint or a shade you are of that color. But we're all that basic color. Nobody's blue. We're all the same basic hue, and we're shades and tint of that hue. Which brings me back to America in blacks and whites, and Chicago in particular in blacks and whites. Here we are in Chicago in 2017, and every day there are reports of blacks being killed by police or by each other or by or some racial stuff going on, right? A guy just showed me in, in Starbucks this morning on Bryn Mawr. An article about a guy downtown yesterday, I think it was. From the University of Chicago. No, no, this, that's another one. A guy downtown yesterday, right across from 225 North Michigan, uh, the Starbucks there, brand new building there, and he was a URAM guy. Looks like a young guy. They actually had his picture in the, in the paper. He said he was about 23, 24. Somebody spilled some coffee on him, and he went into a tirade calling all kinds of racial epithets and spat on somebody. And, and this is in Chicago, but it's nothing unusual. I mean, this is what you'd expect, right? We look at, oh, that's, how, how could anything like that happen? Well, if you know that Thomas Jefferson wrote notes on the state of Virginia in which he said that black people were inferior to white to both mind and body. When you understand that the country was founded on the idea of white supremacy, that's the basis on which the country was built. The economic basis was turn Africans into subhuman beasts, elevate Europeans to just above that, and then the superhumans 
the one tenth of one percent will then control everything. But everybody looks as though, well, oh, this is how did this happen? I heard people talking about Trump. How did Trump happen? Come on, if you know anything about the history of this country, Trump is inevitable. Inevitable. It's amazing that that he hadn't happened sooner, but he's going to happen again unless we finally. Mostly the white people. Why the white people? Because there are more white people, or people who call themselves white, who think they're white in this country, they're the majority. They're the people who elected Trump. And they elected Trump. They said, well, no, well, he wasn't really elected. He, the popular vote, he didn't get the popular vote. But that's just a technicality, right? The white people, the Urams, a lot of them who elected Trump, were Democrats. They hated the idea of a woman being president so much that they didn't vote. I mean, this is my analysis. Ten, from what I've read, 10 million votes that voted for Obama an African American, yeah. those 10 million sat out the election or voted for Trump. Yeah. These are people who voted for Obama. So I get back to America and blacks and whites. That's the, that's the essence of the question. Maybe because I'm an ad man. I'm a recovering ad man, I should say. Because I'm a recovering ad man, advertising man, I tend to try to boil things down to simple, the simplest terms. And that's probably one of the reasons for my coloring book, for my blacks and whites. I'm trying to boil it down to the essence. And in the case of this country and where it is and where it's likely to go, the essence is from the very beginning, from before the beginning, before the actual country became the United States, when it was just the 13 colonies, and when it became whatever it was before it became the United States of America, uh, it basically decided that the best way to, to have a country and to be able to uh, actually manage and control the country is to say one thing and do the exact opposite. Say we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and then put millions of men and women and children into slavery. We're still dealing with that decision. Jefferson, those guys, Madison, they were all slave owners. They all believed in their supremacy. Not necessarily the supremacy of all white folks, but of them as white folks. And they built a country based on it, even though they said, we're going to say all men are created equal as a sales pitch. So PR, I, I call it Thomas Jefferson one of the greatest PR men in the history by writing, for writing the Declaration of Independence. That's a piece of work. Sophistry. He flinched. But I'm waiting rebuttal. I mean, I say these things in the hopes that somebody will say, hey, you're wrong. Here's why. But usually I have people say, oh, don't say that. Oh, I don't want to hear that. Oh, I don't think that. And I say, why? They usually shut up. They don't say yeah. anything. You're going to get a rebuttal tonight. They don't have a why. I do. What's the next slide? They don't have a why. <laughs> if, I get a, if I get a rational rebuttal tonight, it will be one of the first times I've ever got a rational 
rebuttals. You I've will. gotten irrational rebuttals. You'll get a rational one tonight. I've gotten all kinds of rebuttals that are, well, I feel, uh, I think my daddy said, my mama told me, but it's like the Donald Trump. I mean, once again, back to Trump. It's fake news, fake facts. It's irrationalism, emotionalism. It's not based on anything that anybody would agree. They say, well, hey, that's a good source. That's, as far as we know, that information or that basic information is factual. I look forward to it. I want to show you a couple other pictures and then I'm through. Okay, next slide. Because I, I can hardly wait for the rebuttal. Next slide. Now, wait, yeah, yeah, good, good. Okay. Now, you know what this is? Yes. The luncheon. Have you ever seen this before? No. Others like it. These are people like they're at a picnic. Yep. They're all happy. They're having a barbecue. Now, some people will say, well, hey, that's a few guys, a few people. They're not us. They don't represent us. But they do. If you're going to claim uh, the Abraham Lincoln and the best of us, you got to claim the worst because it's from the same stem, I think. Thomas Jefferson said blacks were subhumans, or inferior. Thomas Jefferson made them slaves and kept them as slaves. James Madison, same thing. James Monroe, all of these people. So when somebody, like when Timothy McVeigh, I remember, blew up the uh, federal building in Oklahoma City. And he was wearing a Thomas Jefferson shirt, a shirt with a Thomas Jefferson quote on it. And when I hear about Breitbart News or Steve Banning or the alt right or the Ku Klux Klan, and people say, well, how do those people ever get those ideas like that? You go to the founding of the country, you go to the founders of the country. That's where they came from. That's what they believed. The only, if you don't know that, it's because you're the product of the American education. They don't teach that. So you're legitimately ignorant. As a matter of fact, I want to write a book called The Miseducation of the Caucasian. Carter G. Woodson wrote a book years ago, the guy who was the founder of the Black History Week, Black History Month, he wrote a book 80-some years ago called The Miseducation of the Negro. But our problem in this country right now is a miseducation of the Caucasian. That's why Donald Trump is president. That's why even if you get him out, you're not going to change anything. Because these people know, the people who own and run the country, the Democrats and the Republicans, or the people that they work for, know that the average American is so ignorant He's been taught to be ignorant. The only reason why I am saying this is because I've started educating myself and trying to say, well, why is this? This country says it's about equality, blah, blah, but it's the exact opposite. Why is that? And why is it that everybody goes along with it? Any answers? I'm through. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for answers. Well, I got to stay up there, aren't you? <coughs> we have questions. Well, I got to stay up there. Okay. Yeah, okay. people will ask you questions. Oh, okay. Okay. So this is a question and answer.
Okay. Well, anybody got questions? Before we vote, nobody has okay. I have one. You know, it's often been said that the legacy of race and things determine things. Given the chance that a lot of new republics were set up in the 60s in Africa. Now we're talking about, I'm talking about America, not Africa. That's one thing. Let's, okay. let's get that straight. All right. Well, where does the role of the Christian church come in with the black experience? Because I've often found I don't have a racist bone in my body, but I do judge people by the content of their character. I've known several black people who play the race card, and they're schmucks. I've known several white people who play the race card. They're schmucks as well. I've learned those who are accepting of others as friends not to play the race card. Can you comment? Well... To me, that's very irrational what you just said. That's personal. I'm not talking about personal. I have friends, mm -hmm. as I say in my, some of my best friends are colored. Right. That book is about all my colored friends. Okay. And when I say colored, I mean of all right. persuasions. Right. So personally, whatever my personal thing is, is my personal thing. But that's not what I'm talking about in terms of this country. I'm talking about the country. Right. I'm talking about this country. I'm not talking about Africa, uh, any place in Africa. I'm not talking about any place. Any, the, the, one of the key or the founding principles right. of when I'm talking is that I say, mm -hmm. I base my criticism on right. what this country says about itself. Right. If the country did not say this about itself, it did not have it uh, uh, sup supposedly <coughs> embedded in its laws and in its constitution, then I would have no right to say what I'm saying. I'm basing it on what's, I can't go to some other country right. and say, well, hey, you guys should do this. I don't know what their constitution says. I don't know if they even got a constitution. <coughs> I'm talking about this country. And whatever the personal thing is, some black people are smart, yeah, probably. Some white people are smart, yeah, probably. But that's not what I'm talking about. That's something else. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, to, to illustrate your point, LeBron James said about a week ago on television that it was very difficult to be a black man and wealthy, even in these days in the United States, because somebody wrote something across his... Uh, but if you look at the statistics of the black population, the statistics show that there are more black people who are doing better all the time. And I'm not talking about the west side or the south side, but I'm talking about in general. More black people are going, are graduating from high school, are going to college. Are going to jail. It's a, it's a, it's, it's well, a... No, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's look, I'm not disputing the conditions. Well, but, but I'm like not disputing the conditions. I'm simply suggesting that there is progress being yeah. made over generations. No, it's there a, is, that, that's wrong. No, it's not that's, wrong. That is wrong. It is wrong. No. Oppression, wrong. suppression, repression is alive and well. Let him answer he the has, question. Well, he has reframed, this gentleman has reframed the context into pictures that you can't dispute. These are old pictures. It doesn't matter, it still happens. Let him answer the question. Right. It still what, happens. But what he just what he just said is his belief that I don't think you're born by the facts. <laughs> How about the numbers? Excuse me? How about the numbers of black people doing better, living in better neighborhoods, kids going to school, kids going to college? You know, I don't know. I mean, maybe if you were talking about forty years ago you might have a point. Compared well, to what, what do you think things have changed in four years? It's that's in 40 years. 40 years. If you were talking about 40 years ago, maybe you would have a point. That was the kind of stuff people were saying 40 years ago. No. And 40 years ago, it was probably more true than it is now. No, I wouldn't have Things said have that gone backwards. You know how many African Americans in this city 
have had to leave because they can't find jobs, can't find work. You know how many businesses have closed that black people used to work in? And you're talking about how much better things are? You're living in a dream world. No, I don't live in a dream world. I live in well, a what you just said is I a dream. I live in a statistical world. The Show me the statistics. And, and, and Show me the there, statistics. I'll, I'll be glad to do it. I don't have them with me. But I got one you can't on. find them. Things are better now for more people. You can, no, that's wrong. You don't got it. That's wrong. Well, okay. You know, we're, we're not No, I'm, I'm saying, look, if you have facts, I would like to hear the I'll facts. I'll send them to you by email. No. I wish those facts would, those were facts. We could find That's out Donald Trump fact. That's fake news. It's not fake news. It is fake news. Okay. okay. All right. I first learned about Trump. Me. Can you hear me? No. I can hear you now. I can. When I first learned that Trump won, the first thing I thought was no. that he paid for it. When you have a lot of money, you can manipulate the voting machine. So I don't know who voted for him. I don't know what Well, a lot of people, as I said, a lot of people... He played the race card. You am voted for him, and a lot... Let me finish my comment. Go ahead. My question. So, are you convinced that, that Russia didn't get involved? I don't know for sure. I have no clue. I have no answer to that. Oh, you got a guy behind you? Who, me? No, behind you. Jonathan. And Jonathan. Your name, okay? Jonathan. Jonathan. Thank you for your talk. I appreciate you uh, sharing your views tonight. Every time I go to Springfield with my brothers and sisters of the disability community, we like to tell legislators of uh, the Illinois Assembly that we should tax the LaSalle District so that the rich of the state of Illinois finally pay their fair share and that the poor communities that have been going uh, without on a spider web string budget and have had their jobs shipped overseas could finally see some relief. This is the most taboo subject in Springfield. You mention it to any legislator, whether they're left side of the aisle, right side of the aisle, or independent, they don't want to touch it. Could you comment? <clears throat> well, I'm not uh, well versed. In that. I don't know. It's a service tax. I don't know. But basically it's saying that if folks have their cup running over a thousand times and there's folks that don't even have a cup, <laughs> it seems only to reason that if we're a country that's the land of the free and the home of the brave, there should eventually be a system that fosters equality in policy. And it just seems like anywhere you go, it doesn't have to be Illinois, the rich are the problem that continue to just obstruct every single reasonable suggestion that we make that could build racial equality in a meaningful 21st century way. Well, I kind of agree with some of that with, that you said, but I think it's I think it's deeper than the rich versus poor. Uh, I think the founding principle of this country that we say we believe. Thank you of the idea of human equality. We've never believed it, never acted on it. And now, because it's beginning to show more with not just the blacks who were, everybody, most whites were basically saying, hey, if it's only on the blacks, too bad. Why can't they pull themselves up by the boots? But now that it's affecting whites too, now people say, wait a minute, this is not equal. It's never been equal. It's never been fair. <coughs> Sir? Thank you. Well, he had a picture of that uh, black man being burned up uh, for the past 20 minutes. So, like, that's representative of how uh, whites treat blacks. I, I think that's kind of... Uh, I didn't say that. No, but... No. Yeah, I, I, wait, wait a minute, once again. <clears throat> if we're going to argue, I'm going to argue about something that we're actually arguing about. Not something that you have in your mind. I didn't say that. You're I'm not... I, and, and the idea that I hate white I don't hate white I have lots of friends of color. This is one of my friends right here, fellow friend? artist, right? right? I have lots of friends. I don't hate white. So don't say because I put a picture of this atrocity and I explained it in a way I think that was reasonable. And then and then and then accuse me of, of 
of saying that all white people are burning blacks. But you say you live on the south side. Uh, uh, no, I, no, I didn't say I live on the south side. <laughs> didn't you say south side what? No, I don't live on the south side. Well, you're changing your tune. Though. No, I didn't change my tune. Anyway, what I want You're making to say assumptions. Is, is this is a center right country. This is a center right country. The, 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 we won the election. You people can't, when I say you people, I mean the Democrats. You can't accept that. You Thank lost the election. No, this is not about the election, even. I mean, although I disagree with you. You've been attacking us ever since the election. We can't. No, I was attacking you before the election. Hit on the head. I was attacking you before the election. Stop being a victim. Okay. Thank you. May I remind our... Black Lives uh, Matter attacks us. We don't attack them. But I'm, not part of them black, I'm not part that of... That was in 1920. I'm, hey, I'm not part of Black Lives Matter. You're All pi right. pictures from the you're, 1930s. You're, you're arguing with somebody that's not here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm for black. I like, look, I like to have a conversation. All right. Rational conversation. Can we move on to the next question, please? Please. All right. Next. Who's got another question? Somebody has the same question. Me. Right. Oh, okay, no, ask yeah. a question, Raj. All right, Raj. Now, you are talking, and you have a legitimate point. You, you are right about history, and you are right probably lots of things today. Okay? Kandalisa Rice was there in the height of the government. Colin Powell was there. Obama... <clears throat> We had a senator from here, a lady senator, Mac. And Obama was late behind. Obama was eight years there. He promised that he's going to make everything equal. <laughs> he's going to create a new What's America. That no that? black, no white. Okay? Now, who's responsible? Don't, don't you think they have a responsibility that they fail the black America? Barack Obama did not do anything. I was watching the other day. He, he was, Travis and the Princeton guy and other black leaders they are talking about and consensus was there that Obama did not do anything for black community. So you have the opportunity. America gave you the opportunity to be highest level in this country. Trump, Trump is doing for his people. Obama did not do for his people. And you have to look inside your heart and your mind. There are black people who succeed. They do not go and they help other black people. You know, why, why, why black people like are, why black people are not talking All about right. education? All right, Raj. Raj, do we question. have a question, please? So, so what, 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 what is your take on that? Well, I agree with you about, to some extent, about Obama, but not to the extent that I thought that any one person, president or not, is going to change the, the history of this country. I, I, uh, I'm uh, too much of an, an adult and a realist to think that anybody uh, is going to do that. I, I'm disappointed in Obama because I don't think he did as much as he could have done to at least raise the issue of, of, of the legacy of white supremacy and the need to do something to start. If you're going to do something about income inequality, which everybody now will talk about income inequality. Even the, the liberals will talk about income inequality, but they won't talk about the basic human inequality that's built in and baked into our system. But I agree with you that Obama didn't do as much, and, and I agree with you about Condoleezza Rice, Colin Powell. I agree that they didn't do as much, but I don't expect three African Americans to undo what hundreds of millions of European Americans have done over 400 years. I, don't really, I know that they may be good, but they're not that good. Nobody's that good. That's right. Can, 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 I, can I follow up one little thing? Okay, why, 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 why aren't you talking about education? Why aren't you talking about a, when you get a job, you do the best job? Why aren't you talking about culture? You know, why, why aren't you talking about how to prevent pregnancy or not to create a birth, okay, when you do not have the resources? Why, why, why are you not talking about that what are the problems and present us with solutions? Why not? Well, well, I think those are problems. I agree. <laughs> but I don't think uh, talking about it at that level was like uh, after the, 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 the fire has burned, 
every every room in the house and it gets to your room, then you then you're concerned about doing something. The fire started 400 years ago. All of this stuff and all of this culture that you're talking about is not a result of yesterday or two days ago. And it's not a result of the African Americans who are usually the victims of the problem, not the cause. You and a lot of conservatives have the same mentality. They want to talk about cancer only when it's about to eat up their whole body. They don't want to talk about the cure. They don't want to talk about where it came from. Or, pre or prevention or just finding the cause of the disease. It's a very narrow-minded, uh, to me, uh, uh, way of thinking, I think. But maybe that's just a conservative, that's just a way. And I don't disagree with all conservatives about all conservatives. There's a lot of stuff that I agree with that conservatives say. But there always tends to be, seems to be, this idea that let's just deal with the problem right now and let's not think about where it came from. And let's just look at the people who are the victims of the problem. Let's not look at who may have caused the problem and how they caused it and how they perpetuate it. Let's forget about that because they're rich people and we want to be rich like them. So let's just try to get to be as rich as we can as fast as we can. Now, maybe I'm wrong, but that's my take. Okay. Is there any Miss, other? Miss, there's a lady right back there. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. I just wanted to say that years ago, I ran a single parent program, and the statistics showed that teen pregnancy was higher among whites because it included Appalachia and so forth. And I don't know what the statistics are today. I'm not, I'm not surprised. <clears throat> but once again, as I said, I'm a recovering advertising man. Uh, I spent 35 years creating advertising with some of the biggest ad agencies in the world. Anybody ever hear of an ad agency called Jay Walter Thompson? Yeah. Leo yeah. Burnett. Yeah. Yep. Young and Ruby King. I worked for all of those agencies. Straight out of Robert Taylor Homes, 20 years old. I spent my career in the belly of the beast for a lot of you people, people you, people you would think are the beast. I've learned a certain amount about how things work, how business works, how big business works, and how people are manipulated, and how to manipulate them. And you are all, uh, you're the, you're the, uh, the victims of that. You are the uh, target. We like to use the term target. That's a better word. Yes. <laughs> you are all the targets that, that we, as advertising people, are trying to manipulate and brands, your brains, to buy our brands. How many other people here? Anybody else worked in the advertising business? Yes, sir. Yeah, I did. Uh, then I uh, went into the newspaper industry. Okay, so you understand better than most the realities of, of uh, public propaganda, commercial and uh, so-called uh, social, or what would we call it? Uh, well, we called it public enlightenment. Public enlightenment, yeah. <laughs> public enlightenment. And you see how you see how you see how he said that, right? You see how he said it. We called it. So, but I'm saying the only reason why I have the attitude I have, one, because I'm retired. I've had time to think for a change. I've had time. I've had time to sit back and say, well, why was that like that? Why it are things like this? And because I was in the advertising agency business, and I saw how big business works, uh, and how easily people are manipulated by what they think are the way things are, or the way they should be, or the way uh, uh, it's always been, that I'm just now saying I'm a recovering ad man, and I'm trying to undo some of the damage not only do people like me have done, but that people much better at it and went a lot higher than I did in the business have done, and not just those people who are just the, uh, uh, what, errand boys hired and hands. girls, hired hands, but the real people, the Donald Trumps of the world, who actually are the ones, and Donald, the beauty of Donald Trump, I gotta say something good about Trump. 
Why? How much time do you have to think it through? The beauty of Donald Trump is that he is America uh, incarnate. Uh, he is everything that we are, and he's and he's proud of it, which is America's proud of what it is. He's the majority. No, no. He won the election. He's right. He's right. He's the majority. Whether he won the election or not, he's a majority of people who believe, because if, if it wasn't, if, if people didn't believe that a rich guy, a rich uh, 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 con man, swindler, uh, a, a narcissist, if they didn't believe that he should be president, he wouldn't be president. Evidently, enough people believe they want a con man, crook, liar. What about Hillary? Yeah. Hillary's in another class. I don't. I'm not, Hillary's not a saint to me. <laughs> Hillary's not a saint to me. But I don't think. Uh, as a matter of fact, here's a, a, the uh, uh, analogy I use. I said they had people had a choice, and I, I was talking specifically about so-called Democrats, the 10 million who didn't vote for <laughs> Hillary, who voted for Obama. I said they had a choice to have to decide between. <laughs> A bureaucrat and a sociopath. <laughs> and they chose a sociopath. What does that tell you? What does that tell you about the nature of our mentality? There's three counties in the country voting for him. That's all. What does that say about, I mean, Come the on. fact that this guy, I still can't believe he's president. He represents my values more than Hillary. Well, well, then, the, well then you voted for him. But I'm saying, but. And he representing represents a lot of other people's values more than Hillary. So uh, I, I I gotta agree with you in terms of hey, right. he represents America. Okay. For better and worse. Let's thank our speaker. Okay. You'll get the last word. We're gonna go to rebuttals. Thank you. Okay, uh, <laughs> Let's uh, go to the famous rebuttal period now. Let's have a show of hands. Anybody that wants to give a rebuttal, put your hand up and keep it up so I can get an accurate count. Because we're going to have six people coming up here later trying to cram in at 20 to 9. We're going to get an accurate no, count in the time. Okay. Yes, one, two, three, four, five, Roger, six. Really? And we need to hear it. Nine. Okay, we have nine rebuttals. Let's, let's hear it. Then. That would be uh, 40, enough for five minutes each or less if you can say it in less. Okay. Okay, come on up. Okay. Thank you for the speaker for your presentation this evening. Okay, and this is your we're not trillionaires, not billionaires, not millionaires, not thousandaires, not hundredaires, not dollar heirs, no, not even penny heirs, soul heirs, soul heirs are we. Soul heirs, soul heirs, we the people, you and me. We the people are ready. So that mountain of money who thinks his joke's so funny, who thinks his kiss is honey, who thinks his hate's so lovely, that cauldron of nothing, who claims that wars ain't bloody, who claims that rape's so studly and that ecocide is so sunny, that billionaire ain't got nothing on we. That plutocracy, that oligarchy of greed. Those billions ain't nothing like you and me. That collapsing from within vampires casino street. Soul heirs, soul heirs are we. We the people are ready. A new day is as close as our will to be free. Another world, a mother earth community. Soul heirs, soul heirs are we. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, in the human rights revolution, if something isn't done and in a hurry to bring the African American peoples of the world out of the long years of poverty, the long years of hurt and neglect, the whole world is doomed. And we saw that with the uh, election last year, there were a lot of people proud of dooming the world with the American extraordinary wealth and power and influence that is uh, just, it's like wildfire from Washington, D.C. If you've got people who don't care about the basics of peace, equality, love, democracy, transparency, justice, and respect for Mother Earth, 
whatever it is bad for the people who in this country disagree with Trump, you can imagine it's a hundred times more worse for folks who don't have the economic opportunities that someone like I might have, a non-disabled, white, male, English speaking, born in America, living in the suburbs person. So just times that by a hundred other folks who are in the country, the time that by a thousand, by folks who are disabled, or political dissidents, times that by a million if you're in a country that is in a totalitarian military dictatorship, especially one that has the consent of Washington, D.C., the support of our tax dollars, which is the irony of it all. Henry David Thoreau once wrote, the authority of government, even such as I am willing to submit to, is still an impure one. To be strictly just, it must have the sanction and the consent of the governed. It can have no pure right over my person and property, but what I concede to it. The progress from an absolute to a limited monarchy, from a limited monarchy to a democracy, is a progress toward a true respect for the individual. I think we live at a time where it's most uh, upsetting to see what we have been sowing all these centuries. You know, we're reaping exactly what was meant to happen. We call it the American Revolution, but it was really the rich peoples of America secession from the rich peoples of England at that time. It was a real revolution. Tell there would hey, be yes. a liberation of people with disabilities, of African heritage peoples who were brought here against their will in chains for the transatlantic slave trade. There would be a liberation for women. There would be a liberation for political dissidents. All we're saying is this is America. You know we love our block parties, our family reunions, our picnics, our barbecues. Every day we can vote if we just peacefully and democratically mass mobilize, bring our kids, our grandkids, our parents, our grandparents, whole lot of chairs, whole lot of water, whole lot of canopies and umbrellas, whole lot of porta potties. If we love freedom of speech forums at a little tiny restaurant in Chicago, we could love it in every single community and that would be the checkmate that would put the Donald Trumps and the Mike Pences out of business forever. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, boy. Uh, I should start out by uh, repeating, I did said this a couple of times, uh, I believe in what Carl Schur said, he was a Republican from the 19th century, he said, my country, right or wrong, when right to be kept right, when wrong to be put right. So that's, if that's, I believe in that kind of patriotism, if that's patriotism. Uh, I can't disagree much with uh, what the speaker said. I you know, basically agree with him. I uh, think I heard him the last time he spoke. Uh, I remember that part about the white and the black, uh, him saying that. That was a little bit new. But most of the stuff he said was not new to me. Uh, I've read a number of books on race in America and race uh, in, in other countries, four or five books, six books, perhaps. Uh, so that's nothing strange. But the strange thing that I thought of when he was speaking was that in uh, college, I was a social science major. I had a double major, 55 hours undergraduate, and then graduate, uh, what? Uh, 25 hours or something like that, I had to take a couple education courses. But I had all that social science, and all those books I read about race, I read later on. Now, a couple of those books were not written when 50 years ago when I went to school, but I heard very little about race. I went to Illinois State University. Okay, it's not Harvard, but hey, I should have learned something. And I learned most of that stuff about race, you know, uh, many rivers to cross by uh, Gates and uh, Before the Mayflower by Laurent Bennett Jr. That's an older book. Uh, and uh, four or five other books, Bury the Chains, all those books, uh, Team Arrivals, 
all those books uh, I read after I went to college. So in other words, when I went to college, almost everybody was white. There were maybe 10% uh, black people at Illinois State at that time. In high school, grade school, never saw a white uh, a black person. I went to Lane Tech High School. I think we had one black kid in the whole school. I didn't see any black people until I went in the Army. So uh, I'm just confirming kind of what the speaker said. Uh, it's kind of hard to argue with what he said, except there are plenty of books around. We got to pick up the damn books and read them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I agree mostly with what the speaker said. Why did we bring people from Africa into the South to pick cotton and pick, and pick tobacco leaves? Because it was free labor. And the owner of the plantation wanted to make a profit. Profit is the main reason why we have capitalism. That's a good Capitalism thing. does not care one bit <laughs> Same thing about you or me. <laughs> it looks upon us as commodities to be bought and sold on the market so we can make a profit. And who could make a profit of the highest level was off of black labor. They didn't have to give them anything. They just had them sleep in like a barn. When I went to Washington, D.C., I visited Washington's home. And they slept in a barn on, on straw. And I don't know what they fed them or anything, but it probably wasn't much and a lot of them died. So what capitalism does is try to maximize its profit. It does not care about freedom. What it means by freedom is they have the freedom to exploit people. And the more they exploit them, the higher the profit. But they keep telling us that we're a free nation. And they keep repeating it over and over and over again the conditions people's minds that we're free. And as long as you give people well, enough to eat and a place to sleep, you'll get them to believe in what you're saying. There was one short piece of history where the working class, except for the blacks, made a pretty good living. And that was during the Roosevelt administration and part of the Truman administration. It lasted from about 1933 until about 1970. And then, and then what happened was we had a so-called foe, the Soviet Union. So people compared to the Soviet Union, which was constantly in the process of being overthrown by the United States that had something like 250 bases surrounding the Soviet Union, it didn't want it to succeed. It gave certain parts of the population a good living as a buffer between them and the poorer people of the United States so they could say, this is a free nation and you got a good living. But now that has ended. We don't have that no more. And you're be beginning to see what capitalism really is. That's why they voted for Trump, one of the reasons. The other reason, of course, was uh, the fact of the prejudice 
that they indoctrinated most of the people in the United States with. So they voted for Trump because he, they figured he'll bring back jobs, no matter what he said. Of course, that was all a lie. The United States is not a free nation, never was a free nation. And the only way it got some good results was, was by demonstrations, sit-ins, marches, and things of that nature, because Roosevelt believed in 1933 that if we didn't have reforms, we would be the next country to have a revolution. Okay, right, my comments are of a personal nature. I work for the uh, Illinois Bureau of Employment Security, which is now a department. 3140 West Roosevelt Road. It's a black area. Do you remember the Great Society? Well, I helped uh, run this thing. I, helped, I was a job counselor. So basically we had black people coming in there. And we had microfiche back in those days. We didn't have micro, we didn't have computers. So we tried to give them jobs. There were various jobs and various things. That was the job corps. Anyway, uh, among other things, uh, what I did is uh, I encountered this guy by the name of Dennis Wilson, a young black man. And another, by the way, all the staff was black. Of course. Uh, anyway, they, they didn't like this guy, so they gave him to me. So I was the guy, I, I talked to Dennis, Dennis Wilson. Uh, and uh, I don't know if I ever really got him a job, but I was able to talk to him at least, and he really had a beautiful smile. It turns out that his, uh, he was raised by a grandmother. Yeah. And not too much, I, I'm not sure how long he lived, not too much after that. He went into the black community and he was killed. I'm not sure exactly what happened, but that's just an example. So that's that's the negative of the things. So he came in, he tried to get something, and I don't know if we ever got or anything on. So that's one. Uh, two is a fellow by the name of Sanders Hicks. Sanders uh, was in Evanston. Uh, he was a cab driver before this, and he, he got onto the uh, fire department. Uh, so the fire department said, "Okay, well, okay, you can you can do the, the uh, you can be the driver at the back of the uh, of the hook and line. That's the bottom line, you know." And because he has a supportive mother, he stayed with it. He was treated bad. And this is in Evanston. Evanston is a progressive town, right? But he stayed with it, and at some point he was recognized, and he became the head of the fire department for the city of Evanston. Uh, so he, he made it. Two very selective situations. One, one man that made it, he's, he's dying now, he's 90 now. Uh, and the other, uh, a black man who never did make it uh, and died, died early. Uh, so we've, we've got a lot of work to do. Okay, Andy. You got a clock up, Andy. Don't worry about it. Okay. Um, first off, uh, this is for the camera for people that might be watching. Um, I'd like to just list for people that want to be informed and know what's going on, rather than live in a bubble of terrifying ignorance. <laughs> there are sources that are very highly credible, among the best in the world. One of them is a news website called Common Dreams. Another one is. The Project Censor out of Sonoma State University it publishes a book every year, a journalism school of the top 25 blacked out subjects. We've seen here among educated people here tonight, different people have expressed views that are so far out of touch with observable reality that they would be <laughs> laughed out of a court made up of a judge and jury at seventh grade. Well, how do adults, you're laughing like you know what I'm talking about, right? Our speaker uh, is exactly right when he says advertising works. 
Uh, who knows the name of um, Robert Ruth Bernstein or uh, Peter Duisberg, Dr. Luke Montagnier? Any of those things ring a bell? Well, they have all published books on the myth, the total myth, of the idea that HIV was causing the illnesses misdiagnosed as AIDS. Now, that uh, we still have Americans believing that HIV causes AIDS. It's a myth. We have Americans believing that we were attacked by Muslims, crazed Muslims, on 9-11, when that is a total myth. It was sold as a Hollywood movie in two and a half hours between 9.30 and at noon. Seven buildings were destroyed by a demolition company. They filmed the first two and they said we were attacked by 19 crazed Muslims. One author said, one firefighter said, if we wanted to take over the oil fields and invade off the coast of Norway and steal their oil, we would have been attacked by 19 crazed Norwegians. That's what a false flag operation is. You kill a bunch of your own people in broad daylight and blame it on the people you want to invade. Another big popular myth I've heard expressed here, it has no basis in reality at all if you look at the forensic evidence, is that Americans elected Donald Trump. We didn't. Less than 25% of the registered voters actually cast a vote for Donald Trump. More than the people that cast a vote for Trump cast a vote for Hillary. Millions more were scrubbed from the rolls. There's a, there's a book called Code Red that describes the red shift that happens after we go to bed, the computers shift the votes toward the red, the Republican side. They've been doing it since the Help America Vote Act in 2002. So we have to start speaking in terms of reality. Now, Donald Trump is not the President of the United States. He was not elected. He is a corporate criminal squatting in the Oval Office, play acting the role of the President until his ass gets impeached or chucked out of there. And the question is how long are we as Americans, millions of us, millions of us have a piece of the responsibility. Maybe our speaker's right. No one person can correct 400 years worth of injustice, right? But millions of us working in the positive direction can. Does anybody in here remember when you could get into a fist fight in a restaurant or if you asked somebody to put out their cigarette 20 years ago, yeah. right? Yeah. Show of hands, right. Well, that's an idea whose time to come. It's easier for everybody to breathe. Knowledge moves forward in the direction of truth. I coach 7th graders, 7th, 6th, 7th, and 8th graders for Science Olympia. The first thing we teach 7th graders is in order to solve any problem, you have to first correctly identify the problem. You have to make you have a problem, and then correctly identify the problem, and then correctly identify the solution. A lot of the things we were talking about here tonight, the solutions are published, they're in books. If any of you haven't read Michelle Al Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, I highly recommend it. Yes. The book uh, by Harvey Wasserman and I, uh, Bob Petrakis is called Strip and Flip of our, our stolen elections. Uh, it was published in 2016, just before they stole the election last year. For those of you that aren't aware, Bernie Sanders was the clear winner, and the media made a deal with Hillary to bury Bernie and report him as losing when he was actually winning. Bernie beat Hillary by millions of votes nationwide. There is no debate on that. That's the forensic evidence. But we keep hearing it. Oh, well, Americans are so ignorant and everything else, they voted for this asshole Trump. No, we didn't. Only a small percentage, maybe 20%, what I call uh, the, the Rush Limbaugh ditto heads. They rise off the couch every four years and head to the polls. It looks like the night of the living dead. These people are uh, Fox, you know, Fox viewers. Yeah, uh, give me one more minute. We gave you five. They're Fox News viewers. So, um, censor news is a source. Common Dreams is the best news source I know of. That's Bill Moyer's favorite site on channel 11. <coughs> David, uh, for those of you that have internet access, one last thing, look up an article by David, Professor David Michael Green out of uh, the East Coast. He wrote an article called, Let's Stop Calling Conservatism an Ideology. It's a goddamn death machine. <laughs> and that's, that's what it is. And so we're seeing, uh, we're seeing killers, billionaire killers appointed to run our government right now. So it's time uh, like this thing right. in Chicago, the Corby Club. Thank you.
Like our speaker tonight, I uh, was also in the ad business. I did not leave the ad business because I had some sort of Pauline conversion uh, to do something uh, more uplifting. <laughs> I did it because it was the 1960s. There was a lot of stuff for newspaper reporters to write about, and I wanted and got excitement. Uh, I still follow that profession. I still have a very interesting life. Uh, however, uh, you know, I did not uh, change for any ideological reasons or because of the fact I am more Simon pure than the next person. Uh, I gave up the search for purity a long time ago. Uh, everything this gentleman said, <clears throat> I can't find a single argument against. However, he only tells part of the story. It isn't, well, no, I'm not saying he's like Bush. I'm saying that there's more to the story that he started telling, and it is this. Afro-Americans were not the only group in this country to be discriminated against to the point of, uh, you know, revolution, practically. Um, you had the American Indians. You had the Italians. You had the Germans, you had the Jewish people, and you had the Irish. Has anyone read a book that came out about 10 years ago, How the Irish Became White? Because there was a, because there was a time when guys who looked like me were not considered quite uh, Americans, not considered quite white enough not considered suitable for their neighborhoods. Catholics. Catholics, exactly. Uh, Until yeah. an yeah. event took place in 1861, the Civil War. Mr. Lincoln needed guys who knew how to fight and had no compunctions about fighting and were good at eventually giving orders to other guys. Hence, the Irish. On both sides of the Civil War, Robert E. Lee was, Robert e. Lee was once asked after the war, how did you possibly lose the war with all the good men that you had under you? And Lee said, Lincoln had more Irishmen than I did. <laughs> a joke, but a true fact. Yeah, yeah. And the truth of the matter is that the same uh, black codes that you were talking about were built in large part on the codes that were written by Oliver Cromwell for the suppression of the Irish. You know, it was illegal for a person of my appearance and my religion to teach my grandsons how to read and write. To do that would have meant an immediate death penalty. It was illegal for a person of my persuasion to address a group of more than three people. It was illegal for a person of my persuasion to own or know how to use a gun. Well, they failed at that point because in those days we all knew how to use guns and a few other weapons the English hadn't heard about. But the fact of the matter is, it's not a question of race. It never has been. It's a question of power and privilege. What we have facing us today is going to very soon be, I'm afraid, the greatest clash, class clash in American history. We have Donald Trump at the helm, his appointed son basically running things in the White House, and they are intent on making America safe for the plutocrats. This comes as a major disappointment to the many good, decent people who voted for Trump because they wanted an alternative. They wanted something the Democrats weren't given and the Republicans certainly did not appear to be giving, and that is a decent chance, a fair shake. They wanted jobs. They wanted American uh, money to be spent here and not overseas. They wanted all of these things, and they heard a guy by the name of Donald Trump that they probably never heard of six months earlier, and he was, he was preaching this gospel that sounded also good, 
Only later did people realize that they had been sold a bill of goods and now the American public is absolutely frosty with anger. I see that I'm getting a signal that I've uh, had my time. Uh, all I'm saying is it's not a matter of privilege, or rather it is a matter of privilege, it is a matter of class, it's not a matter of color. This gentleman and most of us would agree on most things. The thing that we all agree on, I think, is that the power of a small group of people in a democracy must not be allowed to dictate the lives and fortunes of 300 plus million Americans. The time is coming and it's not going to be a matter of race, it's going to be a matter of class. And I got news for you, we're all in the same class and as far as I'm concerned that's first class. Oh. <laughs> My name is Raj Patel. In interesting talk. Some, some black leaders, they want to look back. And there are lots of black men, lots of young black men, who want to look forward. One, one day I talk with a Jewish man, Christian man and me, I'm Hindu. And a Christian man says something and Jewish man got upset. And he said, you know what? For a salvation, you got to believe in your God. For my God, I have to work hard and prove myself that I can make myself. And this is the end. This is a difference here. All of you are thinking that, you know, all of you are Christians, you think that Jesus is going to give something. Because yet long as you believe in him. So you want to believe in a good idea, you want to believe in a good story, and you want to go to what you can say good moral. It doesn't happen. If that, that was going to happen, Jesus would have done it. Jesus did not do it. And, and, and so what you are all morality, it's all talk. Next, next, next time we can discuss some speaker on this topic, we got to get some speaker who will say what good things are going on. How black men are making a progress, black families are making a progress, and how hard some people are working, and how ambitious they are, and how deliberate, and how, how hard they were to get educated, make alliances, form a network, and they are succeeding. This thing is bold. Okay, this guy talking about what happened yesterday, yesterday, every, every, ask Mormons, I went to, I went to university in the University of Utah, ask Mormons what they went through. Ask people who went on a trail to California in a settled waste, what happened to them. Ask, read the story about what happened in the prairie, when they were established, or what is the story of Chicago. Nobody had an easy time in this country, period and they don't have any time. I had two degrees and I, I was homeless. I drove a cab, I sold on a street, I went to flea market, I did it. You know, a, and I was, a, I was a rich man's son. But I said, I want to do my own way. And do you know something? I think that's the best decision I ever made. Because you, somebody had to go and tell black man, that you have to carry your own burden. Nobody's going to care for you. You're not going to look somewhere to somebody to carry your burden. Okay? You got to prove yourself. You got to work hard or whatever you have to do it. I I, 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 I had a black customer. Okay? I had lots of black customers. Okay? And I know a lot about black young men. I had 3,000 3, accounts of black men in my business. And, uh, and some, he, he, came, he bought clothes from me, and then he owed me $1,000 disappeared. I didn't see him. I couldn't find his address, nothing. Okay? Three years later, all of a sudden, he came in. He, he showed up, wearing a nice suit and everything. And he says, I want to talk to you. You are the Raj, right? I say, yes, I'm Raj. You know, he says, I owe you some money. So can you pull out my account? I pulled out my account. And, uh, and uh, he paid everything he owed me including interest and everything. 
And do you know what he said? He says, I always thought I can make it, but I did not have enough money to buy clothes. That will make me look good and have me presentable. And you know something? I look fine everywhere. I ask everybody money, nobody gave me. And I came to your store to give me credit. I wore those clothes and I got better, I got better progress and progress. And finally now I'm making lots of money in California. Okay? These are the, these are the people have black men have been all they have, they have bad black people and there have lots of good young black men I work with. I know them. Okay, when you guys are talking, you're talking like this, don't you have better story about success? And do you know, let me tell you something. You are never, black or white or anybody, nobody is going to succeed in the future. If you're making babies, then you cannot support. Nobody, if you are making, if you are creating a problem, before you start your life, you are, you are screwed. There is no future for you. I have talked to white, okay. white women, everybody same story, okay? I'll hold it one second, okay? And, and I'm, what I'm telling you is that, think carefully about your life, work hard, be, be honest or, and, and do lots of networking and do something for black men, build bridges to white people and white men. Because they, they, are, they are your problem and they are your future. Thank you. Okay, I'm next. I'm next. Raj brings up a good point. I am going to be the first to admit, yes, that the black man did not get a fair shake in this country. For many, many years, he did not get a fair shake. Still nor did a lot of the other immigrant groups get a fair shake in this country. But the mere fact that we can acknowledge the problem and make steps to correct the problem is what makes America and the United States a little bit different than some of the other nations on Earth. You know, we may think that we have a lot of trouble in this country, but you know where a lot of the problems come from? Are from us and our own lack of involvement in the political process, in helping our neighbors, and in just being good citizens. I honestly think that I liked what the Tocqueville said back in the 1830s, that America did not get its sense of self-importance and sense of righteousness from its politicians or its political establishment, but it got its wisdom from what was preached in the sermons of the churches on Sunday, that the values that we represent were best represented there. And I think a lot of our present day dilemmas have a lot to do with our lack of seeking out those roots again. I know that uh, my own self, I happen to know a lot of black people who are very good people. Most of them are usually involved in some kind of church or civic organization that uplifts the spirit and helps them get along with their lives. I also happen to know a lot of others who have what I call that victim mentality where they try to blame themselves for, where they tend to blame others for, for their own problems. Raj is right about one thing. We do have a choice. Capitalism does bring that choice and it's hard work to make those choices. And yes, Sid, I agree. Profit is what drives capitalism. Unlike you, I think it's a good thing because it is the engine that brings people work. It is the engine that brings prosperity to our country and has lifted the world over the last 300 years out of abject poverty. You know, many times you guys think of this idealistic socialist paradise 
there are these guys are pulling plowshares up from the ground. Well, I don't know a single peasant who would rather not have a good factory job and leave the farm immediately. The other thing that you got to realize is that the world is moving towards the cities. That in the less than 30 years, we white guys are going to be the minority. You already are if you're over right now. We're already okay. We already are. And that the Mexicans and the other population are going to rise up in power and take our place. It is also my contention that within about 15 to 20 years, due to the upcoming labor shortage, that we're going to be paying immigrants to come here to take jobs, to take care of us old guys. You as an advertising man should know all about this. It's called demographics. And knowing demographic science, you should also know about the rising income of certain members of your race. 30% who are now homeowners and are living the American dream over the last 20 to 30 years. Oh, don't give me that. I know the census data, just like you do, where you find most of your demographic changes. And you can't can constitute the simple changing of the facts because the thing is, certain parts of the population are rising. Now, I will give him the fact that maybe blacks weren't equal citizens until they actually got full civil rights in the 1960s, but it does take a little time for assimilation and moving on in a culture. Right. And I think finally we're starting to see the black race move in the proper and right direction. Thank you. You know, uh, I was thinking, uh, if I was part of a swamp, can I promise you that I will drain it? Oh, I love that. If that's what we are facing today. You know, I'm, I'm the greatest concern is uh, really a touchy subject in so many ways. Um, I guess I would have to share a little bit of my personal experience. <coughs> when, when I was about four or five years old, it was, it was in Europe, and I Maybe saw, talk a little louder. And I saw a black man for the first time. Mm -hmm. The only thing I remember of him, I, I didn't know what I was looking at. I mean, I never seen a black man before. Dark, white, curly teeth, beautiful teeth. And nowadays, I would think, holy, his dentist hasn't got a taste for his money yet. But, you know, that was my only impression. I just did not know what they were at four or five years old. You've never seen one, a black man. That was my first life experience. I don't even remember mentioning it to my parents because I wouldn't know how to describe it. And then um, we had to migrate from there to Latin America. And uh, I, I haven't seen another black man again. And when we were disembarking from the plane, By the way, this black man that I saw in Europe was in American soldier's uniform. And I was disembarking from the plane and I was about five years old. I, I only remember seeing a guy dressed as a policeman and he was somewhat dark. And I remember, I was walking with my parents and I remember just making a turn and running back to the plane. I couldn't explain it. I just, it was so automatic. Like I was running away from somebody. And um, as time went on, and uh, we ended up living in a small village surrounded by jungles, and I had the privilege of exploring the jungles. At that time, I did not know what a mulatto was or 
mestizo or whatever. I saw, I saw this big, from very white to very black, daily, on a daily basis. And I was growing up like that until I was about 14, 15. Not one day did race was coming into my mind. I actually was looking at a black person. I never, it never occurred to me that he was black. I was, well, next minute I could be talking to a white man. It, it didn't even occur who, who he is. You, you look, and you associate with the children which are in the same color of shades and you don't even think of their color. And, and uh, it was a, such a mixed society and there was intermarriage, nobody questioned anything. And I was flying here. And uh, I was already 14, 15, and I was starting high school. And P was strange to me. Never, I didn't even know what it was, physical ed, P. And it was... I had no English practically, but I saw in this gym five black guys playing basketball. And to me, that was a strange game. I never, I only knew about soccer and uh, baseball a little bit, but that's about it. But uh, I, we did already play before. So I joined them and, 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 you know, they accepted me. I mean, it was just like the sixth wheel. And then I, all of a sudden I, I saw that I, I was surrounded by white students around. They were just looking as if something strange. But this was in Chicago, by the way. And, you know, I said, this is weird. I, personally, I, I never thought that this kind of phenomena happened here and didn't happen over there. And, and then, th that was my first realization that I heard the word ra racism and uh, okay. and the comments that I heard from the nun. I see, you're That's kidding. <laughs> okay. You know, I could not, I, I had to learn what racism was and then start practicing. Not that I wanted it, but I, when you are in the crowd, you gotta go along with the crowd. That's nine rebuttals. Did you hold up your I, hand? I did. Okay. Okay, <laughs> okay somebody uh, got a rebuttal in that didn't hold up their hand. That guy jumped with Tim about holding up two hands. hands. Yeah, he held up his hand. I didn't lift it. Okay. All right, let's go. All right. Okay, hit it. I agree with most of what our speaker said, and he had a very excellent talk. The only things that I would say is to say there have been no improvements over the past. 50 years or so, I think is a mistake. To say that we've accomplished everything and to say that African Americans and other minorities, that's all hunky dory and so on, uh uh, I think that's a lot of harsh shit, plain and simple. Um, with regard to certain comments that were made earlier this evening, and unfortunately, the speaker who was sitting at my table doesn't like to stay around for the rebuttals and George <laughs> has already left. Uh, but I will say this. He seems to have this idea uh, that, it, that uh, everything the Democrats have to say is frustration over losing the election. <laughs> and, that it's all, and, that it's, and that all our objections are a lot of horse manure. And that Trump's a great guy who's just misunderstood. Well, I'm sorry if that's true. Hitler was a great guy and he was misunderstood as well. He was misunderstood. Uh, yeah. I have no sympathy for this. On the contrary, I think that... Hillary, in fact, won the election, at least in terms of the popular vote. And it's only because of our rigged electoral system. And one of the first things we need to do is to amend the Constitution to get rid of the Electoral College once and for all. And have presidents chosen directly by popular vote. Period. Plain and simple. And I'm sorry. I think that what's going on in Washington with the investigations by Bob Robert Mueller and the recent Senate hearings looking into uh, James Comey. I think this is all worthwhile. 
And while I've had my differences with Mr. Comey, um, I, given his record, I tend to believe him and not Donald Trump. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I don't. I don't think that. I think Donald. I used to think that George W. Bush would go down in history as our worst president. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then along came Donald Trump. And he now compares to him, the younger President Bush now seems like a positive genius. <laughs> a positively able president. He at least knew how to govern regardless of whether he did it well or he did it ill. Uh, president, or Do I refuse to call him President. Donald Trump has no more idea as has even less idea of how to run this country than does my cat. <laughs> Finally, and I don't know whether I should say this after the dinner table or not, but the best thing I can wish for Donald Trump is for a plague of bed bugs to descend on the White House, the Trump Towers in New York and Chicago, his golf club in New Jersey, and Mar-a-Lago in Florida. <laughs> Our uh, speaker will have the last word. One final note that nobody mentioned. Uh, for those that are really interested, the, it's out on DVD. Greg Palast has a book called The Best Democracy Money Can Buy. It talks about the various types of Jim Crow that, that are being used to disenfranchise black people and poor people, minorities. The DVD, uh, Best Democracy Money Can Buy, the book, and the website. Greg Palast is the best investigative reporter on both thefts. So let's everybody get on the right page and stop thinking that we're voting these criminals into office, and that's because we don't have any common sense in America. People have been trying to do the, the right thing for since 2001, and uh, they've been changing the votes with the voting machines. So uh, our speaker has the last word now. Give him a big hand again, please. You get the last word. Re okay. Rebut all of us. I'm going to I'm going to say uh, something specifically about uh, what one gentleman said about the Irish <laughs> equating uh, the Irish and the and the Italians and the other ethnic groups with African Americans in terms of how they've been oppressed in this country or how they've been disenfranchised and treated like second class and not even humans. I'm talking about, as I said before, I'm talking about this country. I'm not talking about England. I'm not talking about any other country because the only country that I know of with our Constitution, the only country that has the laws that we have a right to uh, uh, try to force the government to live up to is this country, not any other country in the world. So whenever someone equates what's happening here with what's happening someplace else, I say that's irrational. That's what I'm talking about. You're, you're, you're moving the, the goal post. You're talking about something other than what I'm talking about. I define what I'm talking about and my criticisms of this country in this country these laws, this Constitution, this Bill of Rights, this Declaration of Independence, no place else. And when some Irishman, proud Irishman, says they were treated as African Americans were treated in this country, they're wrong if they know the real history of the country. In this country, not any place else, this country made African Americans, skin color, the basis of being treated as subhuman beasts. Not Irishmen. The Irish were considered white. The book that he mentioned, How the Irish Became White, that's what that's about. That the Irish became white by doing what it took to become white. One of which was to do as much as they can to kill and to disenfranchise blacks. The New York draft riots, I'm sure you're familiar with, that's what that was about. The Irish who killed and burned orphanages, black orphanages, because they didn't want to help free the slaves who may come and compete for their jobs. 
in New York, there was a book called White Cargo a few years ago that talked about the Irish and how they were treated as slaves in this country. But it did not say they were, it, they said they were treated as slaves, but they were wrong. They were treated like slaves, but they were never slaves. They were never disenfranchised, dehumanized in this country and, and, and declared subhuman beasts of birth. Commodities, chattel, that's one thing. So don't equate any uh, European ethnic group with what was done to African Americans. And not just done then, but done now. My point as an ad man, once again, one of the things I wrote in another book I wrote called Grand New Race, and another book I wrote called Race Man Answers, that I talked about last time I was here. African Americans were branded. They were the first big brand in America. The British, the Americrats, the people who ran this country, or who were the subset, second string Englishmen who came over here to develop this country, they decided that in order to develop the country, they had to brand human beings as subhuman beasts and they branded African Americans. That was the first big product in this country. That was the basis of all of our economic wealth. African Americans at one point, from what I understand, were worth more than the land itself, the labor, the African American labor. So don't equate, I mean, if you want to be correct, you can be fanciful if you want. You can believe whatever you want. But in the, in the days of Trump and false news, fake news, alternative news, I stand by factual news based on uh, accredited books, accredited writers, and historians. And the Irish, the Italians, were never treated as African Americans, then or now. They were not dehumanized. And, and, and told to be, and branded as subhumans, the brand which is stuck after slavery. More important, I say, maybe than slavery itself, was the branding of, sub, of, of African Americans, of humans, as subhumans. And the brand still sticks. The thing that the other gentleman said, the, the gentleman just before last, who said and talked about how he didn't understand race as race until he got here in this country, that he began to understand race for the first time and how he had to become, in order to survive, a white man. That's the branding of this country. That's the way this country has worked from, from 1619, when the first Africans got here. That's the brand on which this country was built. Bigger than McDonald's, bigger than Coke, bigger than Apple. The branding of African Americans as subhuman beasts. And until people like you, fairly intelligent, I believe, actually understand and admit it, there is no hope for anything else. You can't have, one, some people are talking about arguing the, the, the class versus race. No, it's not a question of class versus race. It's a, a question of humans versus people who want to make others subhumans. It's a, it's a question of the elites making all of us in reality, even though the, the middle class and the, and, the, and the whites who were given jobs thinks that they're above the other people, they basically agreed to go along with the scam, with the crime, of turning humans into subhumans so that they could get jobs. That's class. That's the class you're talking about. They're of the same class. We're all of the same class. Humans. Period. And until you understand that, we're in trouble. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Have a shout. Okay, thank you all for coming. That wraps up uh, the College of Complexes on June 10th. We'll see you all next week. Thank you. Good night.